Okay, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My job will be to keep you awake after lunch. Now, tell me if the screen changed because yesterday you didn't. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about the future. Um, future, maybe future in a few months, certainly in the future in a few years. And then, of course, in the next coming decade, decades, absolutely the future. And the future is an on-demand network experience. Um, those of us that have grew up in networking, networking has generally been very static, very expensive, um, something that goes in once, a telephone company or some large agency like this that puts in, and it just doesn't change very much. Well, technology has gone past that. And we're moving into a paradigm now where on-demand, consume what you need, and then return that pool back to a collective um, pool of resources that um, will provide much more bandwidth, much more speed, much more information, much more quickly, much more geographically diverse um, is, is, is here uh, upon us. And, and that's, that's the, the, what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, now, I've given this talk a few times. Um, one thing that's new today that I'll, I'll, I'll spend a couple minutes on um, that I haven't really talked about in the past is there's a lot of interesting research going on in the community and in this industry on security of SDN's um, systems. So I, um, I actually um, was part of a proof of concept experiment with a, a number of partners, um, and I'll, I'll go through that experiment, which showed that you can secure an SDN network. And then I'll talk about a little bit what, what, the, what that whole world of security might look like in an SDN-enabled future. Okay, so um, with, the, the, with the advent of the cloud and cloud resources, um, the user expectation of everything as, as a service has um, already um, been a, a, a mature concept. Um, the trouble is the network hasn't kept up to it. So, Right now, your, your ability to, to get compute and storage services, to get your data um, anywhere, anytime, is, um, is, is there in principle as long as you have a network connection to support it. If you don't have the network connection, of course, you don't, you don't, you don't have that, that capability. And so uh, us in the networking business have, a, have identified that as one of the key technical drivers for the way we um, are gonna architect networks going forward. Um, so the ability to, to provide network connectivity as a service and then actually to start to think about why do I need specialized devices to do all these complicated uh, telecommunications things? Most of these devices are really just fancy computers with some extra stuff bolted onto them. Um, so if I can virtualize those kind of those those things, and I'll, I'll, we'll delve into this uh, quite a bit um, further. But if I can virtualize them, first of all, I, I can I can I can I probably can't buy them cheaper, at least not for a while. But I can certainly um, operate them cheaper. I can put them where I want, need them when I need them, and move them around quicker. And um, overall, it's much more efficient for me to operate own and operate a network. <coughs> so. Um, this is this is kind of the traditional network um, um, paradigm right now. There's a number of um, layers in the network. You know, if you're talking about WAN stuff, it's um, it's it's all, it's been DWDM for the last 20 years or so. There's a lot of layer two and Ethernet stuff in in the in the network. Of course, everybody is using IP um, as as their over the top um, network service, and these generally. Um, each layer is generally provided by a different vendor in, in, most, in most large networks. Each one's managed by a proprietary um, management system, and each one of them requires a, a separate plug-in into the business of uh, systems that, that uh, run the network. With software design networking, that's going to change. There's going to be a transformation both in software and in infrastructure. Um, the, the point where true multi-vendor integration um, is possible is is um, virtually here. There are, are uh, multi-vendor or multi 
um, domain orchestrators that are available that you can buy today. My company offers one, but we're not the only ones that do that. Um, there's going to be um, software controllers that, that are available today um, from many sources um, that have open interfaces and defined protocols. So it's all standards based. Um, and then there's a, a north, what we call northbound um, interfaces or um, uh, APIs that um, will reach up into the business systems. And, and this, this um, allows the network to, to both grow to much larger scale, but do it in, 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 a, in, a, in a cost um, efficient manner so that you can afford um, to actually um, instantiate the network. Um, we did a, um, a study for one of the major carriers um, my company makes optical network equipment. And we were looking at, if you look at the trends of how data is going to grow over the next um, five, ten years, um, what, what cost point did we have to sell our equipment um, in order for them to make money offering their services? And one of the, the absolutely startling um, things that came out of that, 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 study, uh, that study was that we couldn't charge for the equipment. If we gave the equipment away for free, the cost of the power to drive that equipment was more than it would cost them they can um, actually get out of the river. And what that means is you just can't do it the old way anymore. Um, that requires a new way to think about networks and a new way to architect networks, and software defined networking is that way. So today, um, certainly the focus is still on infrastructure. Um, we, um, and, and this is in terms of where is software defined networking today. It, 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 it's right, right now the focus is on replacing one box for another. Um, there, there's a number of um, proof of concepts and trials underway. That, that actually, this slide's a little old now because now there's a, there's a number of carriers, major carriers around the world that have started to productionalize um, uh, the uh, software defined networking. Um, well, that was 2014. Um, right now, the, the focus is, is mostly on um, service definitions and, 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 of course, revenue models if you're a carrier. Um, for the government, um, in terms of, uh, um, they're not so focused on revenue, but they certainly do have to provide the most capability for the most, um, most efficient manner possible. And then, uh, of course, it's, it's all, all of these decisions are driven by business cases. Um, where it's going to go tomorrow, we'll focus on differentiation and the ability to, to provide um, innovative and agile services. So that means that not only will the serv traditional services you get when you buy telecommunications now be, be um, much faster and easier to get, but services that we can't even imagine now will be enabled by this kind of technology. And, uh, and there's a strong parallel. And, and from the way that the, the cloud evolved and the, uh, the data center architectures um, evolved over the last 10 years um, to support the cloud. Well, this network virtualization and network uh, transformation is following kind of on that same kind of model. So if you remember what the growing pains the data center industry had when they, they were um, pulling their, their stuff together, um, I expect the network industry will have some of the So this is uh, the, the basic um, model, this comes from the, the ONF, um, which is a, a standards body that's, that's working on open standards for SDN. Um, and there's, there's, there's three defined layers, uh, infrastructure, control, and applications. And there's, there's ecosystems um, that are expected to, to grow out of each one of these. Um, certainly for the infrastructure, uh, the move will be away from uh, again, proprietary defined pieces of hardware with specific network functions into a more generalized um, network appliance that can be programmed to do different, different things. And the um, proprietary control of these devices will, will, will evolve to you know, standard interfaces that every device from every manufacturer will, um, will adhere to so that you really can um, buy five widgets from one company and 10 widgets from another and put them together. And you can do that today, it just won't work without a lot of extra engineering efforts. Here we're expecting that, that um, you'll be able to put them together and it'll be seamless. 
Um, certainly in terms of the control layers, the, these, are, um, these are mostly open platforms, open so source software type um, systems. There are, there are a number of competing ones. And I'll talk a little bit um, in the talk about what, what, what standards bodies are, are active here and, and what, what their, uh, their pr products are. Um, but it, the intent will be, again, for multi-vendor control so that it, you can have seamless controls. And, and um, one of the things that we're, we're working on um, from a kind of a defense perspective is that um, when, when you extend these concepts beyond the pedestrian network, pieces that you can control. Um, you can really extend this concept of virtualization and multi-domain um, orchestration to anything. Um, so we actually, the network could actually, controller could, could control terrestrial and SACCOM uh, communication systems off the same enterprise um, orchestrator. Um, and then uh, once you, once you um, put the enabling plumbing together with these common APIs, you're able to build an ecosystem of applications that will instantiate services on the network um, to do whatever you need to do. Um, right, and right now, if you want to send information from one place to another, there's some pretty set and standard ways that that happens. Whether you're, you're sending Ethernet traffic, IP packets, um, however you're going to do it, but it's fairly rigid. Here, the, the, the protocol is defined, here's what's going to happen. Um, given the diverse uh, mission set that uh, everyone has, those mo might not be the most efficient way to do things. There's certainly mission requirements that those protocols just don't support and never will. Um, the ability to do things like preemption on a packet um, doesn't exist right now. It could exist in this SPN uh, defined world. Um, so this is, uh, this is an IT definition, so it's a very similar picture. Um, this was, this was um, um, the set of experiments that were done by the OIF um, in their prototype demo in uh, 2014. Um, they demonstrated multi-layer control, and, they, that, and but specifically what they meant by that was they allowed multiple controllers to exist inside of the same network orchestrator. Um, they demonstrated multi-domain functionality with uh, a number of vendors' um, um, product. Um, I'm going to talk a, a fair amount a little later on about OpenFlow. OpenFlow um, is, is a protocol. It was developed at Stanford. It is um, the pure academic definition of software spy network. Um, a lot of the stuff that I'll talk about, a lot of industry directions and even some academic directions have gone to a, 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 a lot less, less pure um, um, definition that um, allows a lot of functionality without the, some of the, the issues associated with OpenFlow. Um, and of course, uh, they, they documented their results. So in terms of the, the um, programmable network, um, you can look at it either from the top down or from the bottom up. Um, certainly, um, from the bottom up, um, having open APIs that are uh, applied to configure the forwarding plane um, is, is key to the long-term benefits. But then, on the other hand, for immediate benefits, and, and this is this is by immediate benefits, I'm literally talking about providing and a, a reason for someone to buy this stuff. Because, um, I mean, the, the technology has some magic, but you'll never see it if nobody revives it. Um, so for that to, um, to occur, there needs to be benefits to people that buy networks and operate them. And so the, um, the focus has to be on, on, on those business reasons for establishing the technology and not just on the full technology. So in terms of uh, today's uh, network control model, um, configurations tend to be st pretty static. Um, paths are certainly uh, selected one layer at a time, and, and that literally means that there's a fiber path that's planned out when during installation. There will be a number of optical paths that are run over that fiber path. 
And then the, the, either the Ethernet layer or the IP layer will, will then select its own paths to the network. And there they, the, I mean, IP was um, one of its central tenets. Is it, it, it just assumes that the lower levels are there and working fine. And then if, if for any reason a path ceases to, to work properly, it just goes around it. And uh, really, there's no coordination between the layers. And you can, you can, it's almost self-evident then that that's gonna be a, a very non-optimal solution. Um, the ability to um, alleviate router congestion by pulling up another wavelength and adding bandwidth to a, to a particular path is much more efficient than rerouting a lot of packets over a different path. Um, so that's one of the, um, in terms of the pure network benefits, um, that's a, a strong, um, um, attraction to the SD technology. Um, certainly restoration. There's also a, um, a, right now is a single layer, um, which A, could um, result in conflicts, but certainly results in inefficiency. So in a multi-layer networking vision, um, the, the network would have awareness of all the layers, and they could dynamically optimize across what available resources are available. Um, they can certainly um, have some predictive value in terms of analytics that were available to network operators to inform them of impending problems as opposed to just reacting to alarms. Um, you can and, and do intelligent um, cross-layer uh, restoration. Um, and, uh, and actually this, this, this ability to do analytics on multiple layers of the network um, has some really, really interesting capabilities um, that um, extend to things like um, predicting failure of equipment, um, there's some security implications that are very, very interesting, and there's um, the kind of capacity planning aspects that are also extraordinarily interesting. Um, and in, in terms of optimization, you have the ability now to use um, both optimally use the resources available to you, whether it's router ports, um, MAC addresses, or photonic capabilities. Um, and you have the ability then to, um, to most efficiently move traffic around to where, where it's required. Um, and, and you don't have to do that on a layer by layer basis. Um, okay, I'm gonna apologize. I, I, I mean, I don't, so there's just some advertising in this because I work for company. Uh, <laughs> um, so I'm not pitching my stuff on this. Uh, but this is a, this is a, um, a, um, a picture of the, the types of um, functions that can be virtualized in the network. And you can see um, encryptors, you can see WAN accelerators, you can see routers. Um, they, all, they all can become part of the, um, the, the virtual infrastructure. And, and this is stuff that's available today. This isn't magic from the future. This is this is stuff that you can go out and buy right right now. Um, and there's there's a number of companies that are listed here that, that have virtualized um, um, versions of their appliances, and they all can um, um, work together inside this this ecosystem. So, um, for in terms of this, um, network functions. Um, the ability to centralize and distribute them uh, allows for some, um, some, a lot of efficiencies in terms of their use, um, it, so that you can take a function, you buy a license of, a, of, a, of say, a virtual router, and um, on day one, you meet it in Cleveland, for to support where we're going on in Cleveland, but in an emergency, when you have a problem in New Orleans, instead of buying another piece of equipment, buying another license and shipping it to New Orleans, you can take the one out of Cleveland that isn't really that, that, that loaded and move it to New Orleans virtually. And so you can just instantiate more capability where you need it, when you need it, and then after whatever crisis is going on in New Orleans, is over, you can move it back and use it back in the state of the configuration. Um, so in terms of... Are we on it? Absolutely. Okay. Could you go back to the other slide? So I was listening to what you were saying. So you're saying it's an easy failover site in case there's a disaster in one place? Well, that, that, I mean, that's, that's one of the really attractive, um, the, the, the okay. other attractive features of it are 
you know, in the event of a cyber event and you want to roll back to a known good standard or a known good copy of all your appliances. Or even a natural disaster. Or even a natural disaster. Um, so you can, and it's in the cyber event case, you can flush everything and, and reconstitute very fastly. So this is, this is attractive from a coop perspective. So it's certainly attractive from a coop perspective. Okay. So from a natural disaster, being able to move resources quickly into an area is, is, is um, very attractive. And even better, since it runs off, runs on standard uh, hardware, um, you don't need you know a version of this, a version of that, a version of the other thing. You just need a single piece of, of computer hardware with a network interface that that can run any number of these functions that you might need. But but it assumes the connectivity bandwidth is available to support remote virtualization. That, well, of course. I mean that's. But I mean I mean that's that that's. Always a problem, right? And and there's nothing there's nothing that says that this can't go over satellite connection or microwave connection. So I mean, yeah, there's been a coop situation a lot of times when the rest of the infrastructure goes. The connectivity bandwidth often goes as well. That's that's true. Yeah, how do you deal with tail and lambdas at the optical layer? Excuse me. How do you deal with tail and lambdas at the optical layer? Um. Well, I mean the. Um, there's certain rule sets that you have to, to meet in terms of power levels and spectral efficiency and that kind of stuff. But as long as the, a lambda land meets those requirements, it would be controlled by the same same orchestrator. So there's there's no you would lose that distinction between vendor A lambda and vendor B lambda because it wouldn't matter. So they essentially go away. Go away. In, in a sense, they're no longer on. It's just it's just a lambda. Uh, okay, this slide goes down. Goes. Um, okay, in terms of uh, vendor landscape, um, in terms of multi-domain orchestration, I had talked uh, a little about um, the ability to do multi-vendor orchestration seamlessly. Um, th these are, and you can see that almost all the big guys are there. ALU, who's in ALU anymore? Cisco, HP, uh, Juniper. Um, and, and are, are all um, things that have, have been in, in various labs and, and, and um, customer trials, running the software, being orchestrated to, it, 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 in, in a multi-vendor um, environment, and that, that, that all works very, very well. Um, in terms of our, our software suite, um, the, I mean, and then I'm just, this is again, we're going through adding state instantiation. There are certainly others. Um, we break this up, the control <coughs> layer, into basically two segments. Um, one is this multi domain service orchestration. Um, and that, that one is the set of software tools that allows for control of um, spherical networks. So that's, that's satellite plus terrestrial. That's um, satellite plus a radar, that's satellite plus um, a targeting system. Uh, that's all amenable to, 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 to orchestration through that layer. And then lower down on the network side, which is again now very focused more on network pieces. Um, we have one, one set of uh, control um, software for the SDM manager and control, and another, another set to, to manage the virtual function and distribute those. Um, the orchestration component is, is actually a, a, a central uh, to defining and deploying the services. Um, it, it's the tool that you use to onboard a service. Um, and, and, and like everything else, uh, um, every time you, you take a new virtual function, um, you're going to want to check it out and make sure how it works and make sure there's no bugs in it before you actually release it in a while. Um, and I don't believe it, any service provider um, whether it be DISA or at t or Verizon, is probably not going to take the vendor's word for it that their stuff works. So there has to be some in organic testing capability. The orchestrator will give you that testing capability. Um, it will uh, allow you to do the life cycle and policy management um, for you know, what, what, um, what functions actually will fit with other functions. Some of them will have um, conflicts and you'll have to avoid that. And it's the orchestrator's job to, to manage that, that uh, 
kind of sausage making of how the network goes together. Um, and then again, the, the global resource management, and that's that's the, the whole concept of you've got X number of licenses and where you put them um, will depend on what your traffic flow looks like and what your um, 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 mission environment looks like at any, any given time. And you, and you want to be able to, to, to manage that and then, then change it as, as you need to. So um, certainly key uh, NFP orchestration consideration, it has to be open and it has to be multi vendor. Um, so if you've got a solution that, that's, that's dependent on just one vendor, um, you're, you're really missing out on the technology. Um, so you, you need to be able to support any VNF um, and without vendor lock-in. And that literally means that you, if you, if you like Brocade's router, you should be able to buy Brocade's router. If you like Cisco's router, you should be able to buy Cisco's router. It really shouldn't matter to the technology whose box is, is, is behind it. Um, and that's, and that's it. it's important that the software doesn't get locked down to one solution versus another. Um, certainly defined APIs. They're easily programmable and integrate with all the, the major existing OSS is, um, is, is very important. Um, FCAPs is the alarms, uh, the protection, um, and the, the, some of the planning tools. Um, so if you're gonna do carrier grade type equipment, these are, these are absolutely mandatory um, services. Um, I mean, to be programmable, um, you need to have flexible data models. So that you can um, you can instantiate rapid service. I mean, one of the, the, the absolute um, strongest motivations for this technology is the ability to roll out services very very quickly. Um, that that the, all the carriers that have adopted this, this that was their main reason for doing it. And of course, again, stitching together um, both physical and virtual resources in, in a multi-domain uh, fashion fashion is also important. Um, okay, so <coughs> filling this out, um, computer's doing things that are crazy. Um, okay, so this, this is, um, again, another picture of the architecture, um, where we're talking now about evolving from where we are now to where we want to be. Um, so, the standard NMS software that, that you run now in the network isn't going to go away anytime soon. Everybody understands that. So there's got to be a hook into the new orchestration <coughs> software that allows um, management of, of legacy uh, devices. Um, you certainly want to be able to, to um, instantiate software-defined services um, to give that on-demand network experience. Um, virtualization um, is going to slowly evolve in the marketplace. Um, it's probably going to start at the enterprise edge where um, we're removing the firewall and, the, and maybe the encryptor and, and um, some other Ethernet boxes right at the enterprise edge um, will we'll probably happen first because it's just the, one of the least efficient um, places for, uh, for actually putting in physical hardware. And then certainly in the data center, um, being able to, to um, really realize the promise of cloud with flexible network to go with cloud services. Um, so there, be, uh, uh, um, there already are being developed um, specific hardware, software, and um, control capabilities for data center interconnects. Uh, so I have now, I've already um, mentioned that of course multiple vendors, cheaper equipment, um, moving orchestration beyond the, the typical network um, and certainly enhanced resiliency. Um, being able to manage each domain as a dynamic, dynamic enterprise uh, that's responsible, uh, responsive to changing requirements and being able to manage the intra-domain response. Um, right now that's really managed by policy outside the network itself. It's really a network has not function in that area, but that's, that's going to change. Uh, so this is work um, that uh, the ONF has been working on over the last couple of years. Um, they're, they're certainly trying to complete all of the transport um, level functions of SDN. As, as you may be aware, may not be aware, um, 
SDN really grew out of academic research and it was focused on layer two Ethernet stuff. Um, and the, the reason the, the inventors invented it was they, um, because of the rigid um, uh, rules that existing protocols imposed on network communications, um, and no vendor was willing to let the academics break their boxes apart to change those rules. And the, the academics felt that, well, how can we, how can we envision the next network if we can't change the rules, because if the rules are fixed, the network's fixed. So, um, so that's where SDN came from. Um, but now, as we, we, we take a more sober look at it in terms of actually selling it to carriers and selling it to the government and making it into a business uh, proposition, certainly um, being able to, to extend this out to the, the transport where, where it, it touches all the devices, all the, all the routing devices at layer three, all the photonic devices at the lower level. Um, and that means doing all of the, um, the kind of the pedestrian work that network operators have been done, doing for the last few decades with all of the, the alarm capabilities and the performance monitoring capabilities um, that are inherent in carrier grade equipment. All that needs to be with the protocols as well. Um, certainly, that, um, that's been built going in the southbound side and northbound. Um, again, there's a, there's, there's an enormous amount of um, embedded infrastructure in taking data out of networks and, and moving it towards building systems and other business processes. And um, having, having the, the defined interfaces that allow the, the new network architectures to interface with those legacy systems um, is, is also very important work. Um, so this is the Etsy NFBD framework. And I think so um, So it has three functional components. It has um, the virtual network function, which is um, uh, just, it's a software instantiation of a traditional network device. Think an encryptor, think a firewall, think a router. Um, there's the NFB infrastructure, which are the hardware and software resources which create the cloud environment that you can deploy using NF and BNF in. Um, and th this is the worst acronyms that you ever are because you've got NFB, which is the architecture, and then BNFs, which are the virtual functions. And they're, all, they're only looking to confuse people. Um, and then, of course, management and orchestration because it's, it's, it's very important um, for this ecosystem to survive. So, People have to be motivated to um, develop these uh, virtual functions, which means they have to be able to get paid for them. Um, and um, as a carrier um, develops services for um, the, the, the user community, they have to be able to track what services you need to um, consume, and, and of course get paid for that. Um, so and that, that's, that's the, the ecosystem. Um, when I talked before about um, the difference between open flow and um, what's more commonly called SDN now. So open flow is pure SDN. Open flow is a complete separation between the data plane and the control plane. And it gives you a, 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 the opportunity in every network element to um, write the forwarding tables so that any packet that comes into that, that network element will go, what, what happens to that packet, whether it gets returned, dropped, forwarded to any, any given destination, is dependent on what's in that forwarding table. That, that, that is SDN in its pure form, and if you do the thought experiment of what that means, is it, it means you can construct entirely new network um, capabilities that just aren't in existence now, um, certainly the academic community is very interested in that. They're the ones that, that still continue to push open flow um, very strongly. And here's the downside. Um, when you do that, um, if, if you hook up an IP router, a Cisco IP router, and you properly configure it, and you hook it up to another Cisco IP router, or to a Juniper IP router, and they're all properly configured, and you put a packet in, into, into one place, 
and expect it to come out in another place, it will. And if there's a problem, it will report the problem to you. And you have a, a, a well understood process to fix that problem. Go back in that open flow world where it's a, uh, you have complete control over everything. Um, it's your responsibility now to make sure that packet gets from A to Z. Not the hardware vendor, not the software vendor, your problem. Something goes wrong, your problem. And if, if it, when it goes to fix it, again, your problem. In the academic world, that's not that's not that big of a deal. They they deal with that kind of um, you know bleeding edge all the time. In fact, if they're not doing that, they're not they're not happy. I can't imagine this doing that. Um, so um, so there's 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 a couple of, of, of um, kind of models um, that you'll hear talked about: NetConf and Yang, and what these really are is it's a, a taxonomy for talking to the legacy interface that the, 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 the equipment already speaks. Um, so Cisco's um, boxes talk in specific Cisco language, Juniper boxes speak a, a specific Juniper language, and Brocade's boxes speak a specific bro Brocade language. Now, if I take the basic functions that they're going to do, um, and this is a very good definition if you read it, I, I won't read it for you. Um, if you take the basic functions that they do, you can start, you can define an interface based on those functions, the things I want to do. I want to set up a service, I want to bring down a service, I want to know whether if the, I'm not seeing a good signal between two elements. There's, I mean, there's you know 30 or 40 different core things that network elements do, and regardless of protocol. So if I if I if I if I can kind of model those set of activities that the network elements are going to perform. And then I take a, a, a small translation program, and for bringing up a service, I got, I've got a, a small module that says bring up a service in Cisco, bring up a service in Siena, bring up a service in Juniper, bring up a service in ALU, whatever. Um, then these, these small pieces um, be, become very simple translators that, that allow the same interface, the same set of software tools, the same orchestrator to now work on legacy equipment that has all those guaranteed um, performance um, uh, parameters that came with the old protocols. In fact, you still use the old protocols. Um, and this is um, um, an, an example of, of, of over the, the last couple of years. Um, you know, whether this is going, you know, how much of this is being adopted in, in layer zero to three devices versus place the, the higher levels of the, of the Stack. Okay, talked a little bit about REST APIs and explained a little bit what a REST API is. It stands for Representational, Representational State Transfer. Um, it, um, it's, it's basically the architecture for distributed systems, uh, such as the World Wide Web. Um, it's, it has emerged to be one of the dominant web services model. Um, uh, the web service um, using HTTP as a transfer protocol and, and provides uh, both media type um, supported by the web service and a set of operations supported by the web service. Um, so there's four verbs, get, put, post, and delete, and, um, and then there's and an each each line in the thing is there's four commands you can give it and, and you tell the network tell them what to do. And you can build up any service you need based on these, these four different verbs. Um, so here's some so here's just an example of what a um, you know what a REST interface um, uh, kind of uh, script looks like, um, and then uh, the, these I assume these slides are available to everyone because I've used them in there for your reference and you can, do, you can certainly do more research on on the, the REST APIs. Okay, um, so this is this is. Um, but this is back to the, the open flow discussion. I'm going to talk a little bit more deeply about open flow. Um, so you can you can look at, at this this SDN um, revolution. It's, it's kind of um, two very different ways. Um, one way, which is kind of what the commercial industry is right now, is we want to solve the ESRI's problem better. So if we just make the network scale better, make it cheaper, make it more efficient. 
um, that there's no business there. That, that that's that's the, the next the best next step um, for um, for commercial industry. Um, being able to add some centralized intelligence, being able to control legacy equipment, that's that's a, a good um, next step. Um, but that that falls behind um, the better mousetrap part, which is where we are now. Now. The, the ultimate goal, and I think history will be here too, it's going to take us longer, is to, um, to, to go full Monty and, and um, get completely separate control and data plans and make the, the protocol robust enough that um, it's not, not your problem anymore to um, fix a problem when it occurs in your network, even though you have complete control of what happens in your network. Because the control is now robust and mature enough that you have confidence when you're building the, the, those state tables that, that it will work uh, properly. Um, the, the idea is to get away from having PhDs do every network calculation um, because that's too expensive. So uh, here's the security piece. Um, so I, I, I was at a, um, it was an academic conference. Uh, it was probably in 2012, and one of the, um, I forget that gentleman's name, but he was one of the core team at Stanford who identified the open flow. We were in a meeting about security, and um, he got up and, and, and said, you know, if you really think about it, SDN is more secure than a standard network. I, at the time, I certainly didn't believe him. Uh, but it became in a lot of thought since then. And I have a lot of background in um, um, secure networks. Um, and I, I wouldn't have to shoot anybody, but I would go to jail on something. Um, centralized control is certainly easier to protect than distributed control. Looking at one place is a lot easier than looking at every place. Um, if network behavior is dictated, um, one, one, of the, one of the things that's very difficult in the standard network is if, if packets are there that don't belong there, they're very hard to detect um, because there's a lot of traffic on the network that is just administrative traffic for the protocols. And so being able to sort out what is where and why is very difficult. It takes um, dedicated expertise and usually dedicated expertise in each layer. So if network behavior is dictated because you, the, the, the mission owner, have mandated this traffic will flow in this way and only this way, the anomalous behavior is much easier to detect. Um, there certainly is um, improved resistance to DDoS um, because you, you can ramp. Um, there are, um, in, in the, the SDN standards bodies, pe people are taking security um, seriously. Um, there's um, the use of certificates for authentication in um, is this under consideration at the OIF? And there, there is an active uh, study group. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the SDN controllers, a lot of the, the, the components that make up the, the software is all open source. Um, that gives some people, um, you know, makes you cringe. Um, that's a, in my mind, that's, that's a double-edged sword. Um, there, there are advantages to uh, open source is the fact that, that many, many different eyes are looking at the software to look for problems. When a new uh, change is submitted, that, that certainly is a plus. Um, the the uh, open source question is going to probably come down to you know basic blocking attack and hygiene. Where did the open source come from? Who's using it? Um, if you're using the, the, the open source so software that's supported by the Googles and the Facebooks and the Amazons of the world, um, well, that stuff probably doesn't have too many, have too many holes in it because it's just you know, too valuable to those, those very, very large corporations. Um, so it, it's, um, it's going to be it's going to be basic hygiene, it's going to be architecture. How, how, how do you use these software tools? Um, uh, but that open source software is, is, is part of the security conversation because it's a part of the way these technologies are being developed. Okay, so key vulnerabilities. 
Um, certainly the, the control of communications are an attractive target. Um, it's a new attack surface. Um, uh, threat ecosystem, I, I think, right now is, is very undefined. Um, but you know, if you can you can intercept those control of communications, you own the network technically. Um, and you can do literally anything. Um, consequences and error are much, much higher in the SDN um, network than they are in a traditional network. Um, either for you know appropriation of network uh, resources for unauthorized purposes. Um, I actually, I think that that will be one of the main attack vectors. Will be kind of a half criminal, half kids kind of freaking thing to uh, be able to steal bandwidth. And then, of course, the ability to, to disrupt um, or alter legitimate traffic. Um, SLAs become much more difficult um, because there's more par parties involved. Um, instead of a single vendor that provided you your, your, your routers, now you've got a hardware vendor, a controller vendor, and an application um, developer who <coughs> are all involved in, in, uh, in the mix, and, and you'll have to, uh, each one of them will have to be somewhat liable in some fashion. Um, and and wh to what extent and to what distribution becomes um, interesting conversation for lawyers, so I'm not a lawyer. Um, exfiltration of data um, is, is, uh, is one of the places where uh, forensically most actors get caught. Um, that now becomes a much, much easier thing to, to either perform or hide. Um, within the SDN network. Um, so that's another key place to think about um, vulnerabilities. Um, so in, um, a couple years ago, uh, I did a, um, an SDN uh, demo. Uh, basically, it was a simple SDN demo, and I was just doing um, bandwidth expansion and correct contraction between data centers. Did it for one of the intelligence agencies. And I, I, we, we loaded up one of their data centers, and they wanted to offload uh, the traffic to another data center and ramped up the network so that it that all works in the standard. It, um, the of that type of SDN demo has been done. Um, and they, they looked at it and said, that's great. We, we even like to buy it. But then they said, is it secure? And I can go, oh, no, probably not, right? So we decided to do an experiment. Um, and the, 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 the goal of the experiment was, because I, I, I kind of took the position that, that said, yeah, I, I know about the vulnerabilities, the enhanced vulnerabilities on the other side of the that I just talked about, but the tools for protecting an SDN network are any different than the tools I used to protect the network. Same tools, it should work the same way. So that, so that, I wasn't worried about my ability to protect the network. What I was worried about was would I break the SDN and no longer have a functionality. Um, so I, I put I put a fully locked down um, a security environment. Used encryption everywhere, authenticated um, things, authenticated users, authenticated machines, uh, audited everything. They had logs of every um, every transaction on the network. The, exactly the kind of things to protect the domain today. Um, and then I I, I well, we, we put this together and we looked at, is the SDN functionality still there? Is the security still, and did I break any of the security rules that, that, uh, that are in our go-to environments um, um, compatible? Um, use the multi-vendor uh, equipment set, because that, since that's a key tenant of SDN, I, I want to make sure that that was um, um, functioning. Use two different SDN co controllers, one at uh, layer one and one at layer two. Um, and um, you know, basically what we showed was balance on demand and integration with a uh, load center, uh, data center load uh, balancer. So we used the full DOD like security environment. Now I'll admit I, I didn't use type one encryptors because I was, I was showing this in a lab and so I didn't want to deal with all the permissions and everything. So we used type three encryptors, but other than that, it was full, um, full, full security. So I encrypted the data in flight um, I encrypted all of the uh, controller communications between each of the controllers and the network elements. I authenticated all the controller communications. And that means that every time a controller told the network element to do anything, it got authenticated first. Um, I authenticated all the personnel that had access to it, um, used access control lists and two-factor authentication for system administrators. Um, 
I, I um, maintain attribution scans via an RNA log, and, uh, and I was able to separate the security functions from the standard uh, system and administration. So again, the same kind of security environment that those of us that have been in government networks um, are used to get. Were you using authentication certificates tied to the executables themselves, as opposed to data traffic? Well, no, what I was doing was I was using uh, some some software from a, a small company that basically encrypted the um, the header of the first first packet in the session. And so if you didn't have like, that the corresponding key, you, you didn't get any, you didn't, that communication channel wouldn't open for you. So um, I did it that way. Um, I, was, I was also trying to test out that technology as well. So. That would protect you though against the threat factor against the organization. No, no, we would not. Um, so, in terms of the results of the experiment, um, the SDN capabilities worked um, identically, um, whether I turned the security controls on or off. Um, and then the security appliances functions without, without issue. Did you measure throughput differences? I did, I did, well, I looked for them, I couldn't, I couldn't measure them. Yeah. Um, so um, certainly to, um, to, uh, to, to ensure network security, you must, you've got to ensure the full standard control. Um, so all those communications between the orchestrators, the, 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 um, the application specific network functions, um, down to the network element, uh, elements, um, they must be authenticated. All that communication has to be authorized. Um, the data in those communications must be assured. Um, encryption is, 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 is probably still the best way to do it. Um, and then being able to partition um, uh, these layer two virtual machines in, in either the hardware, the software, the firmware um, is an interesting way to, um, if I know it's okay, uh, change the, um, the, the, the underlying physical architecture to help um, um, enhance the security of the overall SDN. Um, so, and now I'm going to talk about kind of the current state of research in network security um, SDN. Um, so, the, the advent of virtualization and um, the ability to do analytics on the enormous amount of data that's generated by the network itself when it's doing these um, um, functions. Um, provides a, 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 a completely new way to look at network security. I'm not now I'm not trying to keep bad guys out, right? Because we already know you can't really do that. Um, but what I want to know is um, who's in my network, what they're doing. Um, I don't think I'll ever know the why, but I can certainly know where. Um, and, um, and, I, and now I have the, the ability to um, look at. Um, you know, flow logging and decision making, and um, I, I, I know what um, the, 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 the authorized paths are because I told them what the authorized paths are. Um, before, they couldn't pick them for themselves. They, you, didn't get to, you don't get to tell them what, what, what physical path is going to take it, fix it. Um, but now, um, in an SDN world, as an upper, I get, to, I get to decide that. I can say this is an authorized path and that one's not. If I see traffic going from those two places over this other path where it wasn't supposed to be, that's something I can fly. Um, I have the ability to um, um, provide automatic um, detection and certain reaction. Um, I, I have the ability now to, um, and there's companies down there on the floor that are already pretty far advanced in this kind of um, activity of um, identifying network reconnaissance behavior, being able to flag that and, and alert. Um, um, being um, ultra sensitive to the exfiltration problem and um, using your SDN architecture to segment data in, in such a way that makes exfiltration that much harder. Um, it's certainly on the planned and on thought about um, uh, SDN networks will enhance the ability to do exfiltration. But if you actually build into your SDN um, controls um, preventive measures for exfiltration, you can make it harder. Um, 
Um, certainly, you have the ability to detect unauthorized network utilization, and to some level, you know, once you've kind of gotten past that, I don't care who's in there, I just want to know what they're doing, um, you now have a shot, a legitimate shot at the insider threat, um, which is really um, a very difficult problem today. Uh, okay, so I'm, I'm pretty, I think I'm pretty close to the uh, time. Um, two minutes. So the, the, I, got, I got a bunch of slides on, on the very standards, and I, I, I'm happy to go through them with you. Um, or you can ask questions for two minutes, and, and that's let's thank you. <laughs> so, all right, we're doing standards. Um, okay, so Open Daylight, this is an open source controller platform. Um, it's, it's a really wide um, deployed controller. Its, it's main competitor is a controller called Ponus. And uh, we'll get to this in two minutes. <laughs> If I was to maybe summarize the entire thing, it sounds like it's an argument about let's not fight over the network and everybody share, and then it's just more going to be about the quality of the services or applications, and then hardware itself, like better chips. And you're kind of trying to take out the middleman almost. That's exactly right. That, 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 is, that is the whole paradigm that we're trying to take through. Uh, maybe we're headed toward, okay, the network's already in place after, after we built it up since, whatever, 20, 30 years ago. Right. Eventually, you kind of run out of room, and you just have a bunch of network devices plugged together. Exactly, exactly. And then, and again, like I said before, since you can't physically the network of tomorrow, we can't not build it the way we build it today because it just won't work. Right. So, um, by by going on to that next well and virtualizing as much of it as we can, that that's kind of that way out to get to. Uh, it will need to be, and I think that gets us just power.